Well, good morning. morning. Happy Mother's Day, ladies. Um, Those of you who are moms, a special day for you. Good to see you all here today. Let's all stand for our call to worship from Malachi chapter 4. But for you who revere my name, the Son of Righteousness will rise with healing in its rays, and you will go out and frolic like well-fed calves. Now that's a picture, isn't it? <laughs> uh, let's, let's all sing together. come into this place today to worship you, to celebrate you, and Lord, we come here to, as we celebrate your many blessings, we seek more, Lord. We, we want more of you because we know how good you are. So Lord, come, meet with us 
here by the presence and the power and the moving of your Holy Spirit so that we will leave here a little different than when we came. In Jesus' name, amen. It's not my life to live. It's not my song to sing. All I have is his. It's all about Jesus. And so we crown him. We sing the song, crown him, Lord of all. And, you know, when I first heard this song a few years back, I wondered, how do we do that? It's by giving our all. Giving our all in worship. Giving our all for his glory. Let us crown. My life to live, it's not my song to sing, all I have is His, for all eternity, it's not my right. to catch those uh, slides of announcements that were, um, were scrolling earlier. Um, if not, uh, read your bulletin. If you don't want to read your bulletin, then go watch the beginning of the service online on Facebook later on. But uh, we, we, um, we are grateful to have a special day to celebrate mothers, but also to celebrate graduates. And so we do that today, celebrating our, our graduates from high school and uh, you'll, you may have noticed um, on one of the slides, but also in the newsletter that there are some other graduates, some um, college uh, graduates graduating with master's degrees, bachelor's degrees, those kinds of things. So um, that's always a great thing to see. And, uh, and so we are entering that time of year. Summer is coming, and God sends the rain. Amen? 
yeah, that was good. That was so good. And what, what, what a blessing to um, be able to enjoy the goodness of the Lord. Um, we want to uh, spend some time in prayer. And as we do so, um, we're just going to start off with a time of praise. And if you have something that you are thankful for, uh, you want to praise God for, just say that out loud um, to encourage the rest of us. Um, also, I want to add to your prayer list, um, Ash Richards. Ash Richards is, I can't remember how old he is, um, but, but he's the y- young boy of uh, Sean and Ginny Richards in Manam, Papua New Guinea, and he has had a foot infection that they're having a hard time knocking it out. So pray that he can be healed. As you can imagine, the medical care is, is different there. And so be in prayer that God would heal his foot. Um, any other prayer requests? Well, uh, let's, let's go to the Lord and, and let's just give him praise and thanksgiving right now. Let us begin that way. Father, we praise you for your King of kings, you are Lord of lords, there is none like you. You are our creator God and our redeemer God. Oh God, you have been good. We praise you for the rains yesterday. And Lord, we thank you for the beautiful um, weather we've had for planting. Lord, we thank you for your goodness and grace displayed in just our daily, uh, covering our daily needs. Lord, we thank you for families. We thank you especially, Lord, for mothers who take their role seriously and give of themselves, raising children, taking care of a home, oftentimes working outside of the home, and um, Lord, we just thank you for the gift of family. Lord, we thank you for um, the opportunity that we have in this country to get an education. And Lord, we thank you for the many graduates who celebrate an accomplishment. We ask, Lord, that you'd go with them as they um, make their way into adulthood, into Um, whether it be college or off to work, we thank you, Lord, for the many opportunities. God, you have been good to us, and you have called us to a great and awesome mission. We thank you for the men and women who have said yes to go to the unreached peoples of the world. I think of the Webbs and the Richards, the Passmores, and God, we thank you for the way that you're working through their ministry Help them to see fruit of their labor, and we pray especially today for a little ash that you would heal that foot. 
so they could go back. Um, he and his mom could go back and serve. Thank you, Lord, for this church, as one has already said, and for the ministries that you have allowed us to be a part of, to be engaged in, in this community. We pray for the hearts and the souls of men and women, and I think of Vacation Bible School coming up. We pray, Lord, for the children that will be coming. We pray in advance that you would prepare their hearts to receive the gospel message so that, God, many would come to know you and your name would be praised. Help us now as we sing to you, as we sing to one another these songs of theological truths about who you are. Lord, continue to guide us in our worship, we pray. Amen.
His mercy is more. He doesn't remember our wrongs. Our sins are cast away. As far as the east is from the west, His mercy is more. His greatness, His mercy. Um, we do something at Sun Prairie each year about this time, and that is we um, celebrate our graduates, and um, we we want our graduates to go off. Uh, so, so graduates and parents, come come on up. <coughs> graduates from high school, that is, and um, we we think it's fitting for. Um, Parents to offer a blessing to their graduates, and so that's what we're going to do now. And um, I don't say a whole lot about this, except that um, except that sometimes they get a little emotional, and, and we can understand that. It's it's not always that these people stand up in front of a group of people and and talk. So um, who wants to begin? All right, Amber, um, there you go. Abby Jo, God truly blessed us with you as a daughter. You accepted Christ into your heart at a young age, and we are thankful for those in our church, Pastor Mark, family, and friends 
that encouraged you and taught you about the Lord and his salvation. Your faith is strong and admirable, even through diversity and struggle. Your father and I love you very much and know that you'll be a shining light wherever you go. Your adventurous curiosity for life will serve you well as you go out into the world without us. However, know that we are always still right here, only a phone call or text away. The verse we chose for you is 2 Corinthians 9, 8. And God is able to make all grace abound to you, so that in all things, at all times, having all that you need, you will abound in every good work. The good Lord has a plan for you, and remember that no matter what, he is there to comfort and guide you. As you leave our home and move to the next step of your life, we pray that the foundations of faith you have learned will serve you well. We pray that you will stay close to him as you go out into the world, and if ever you stumble, turn to the Lord and those who know him for support. We are so excited to watch your journey and where the Lord leads you. To our little Miss Maddie, who isn't so little anymore, we remember the day you were born with all that black fluffy hair on your head. It seems like yesterday when we first held you in our arms, and we would love to have that time back, but now today we must start letting you go. I had to ask if that was truly my daughter when you see all, seen all that hair. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So God has blessed us with a beautiful, smart, and talented daughter. For 18 years. <laughs> All right, here we go. For 18 years, we have done the best that we can as parents to guide and mold you for your future. We do not know what the Lord has planned for your life, Maddie, but He sure does. We hope, or excuse me, we have hope and faith that you will live out your dreams to the fullest with the Lord by your side always. We pray that you priori prioritize Jesus into your life daily and set your heart with a holy fire. May you continue to be a light to those around you and remember to believe in yourself like we believe in you. We are your biggest cheerleaders, Maddie, and will continue to guide, support, and love you in all you do. Life can be so good, but it can also be hard, and we will be here for all your successes and your failures. Yes, you will fail at times, but it is okay because you have the love from us and the Lord to help you through it all. So we ask the Lord to continue to bless you with love, protection, mercy, strength, and wisdom. That you hold his word close to your heart, and that you take these special verses that we put together for you, um, and wanted to share with you. The first one comes from Joshua 1 9. It says, Be strong and courageous. Do not be afraid. Do not be discouraged, for the Lord your God will be with you wherever you go. Next one is Proverbs 13 20. It says, Walk with the wise and become the wise, for the companion of fools suffer harm. The last one is. Jeremiah 29, 11 through 13. For I know the plans for you that I have declared for you, says the Lord. Plans to prosper you and not to harm you. Plans to give you hope and a future. Then you will call on me and come and pray to me and I will listen to you. You will seek me and you will find me when you seek me with all your heart. proud of you uh, we're proud of your uh, 
struggles and your accomplishments. Um, we've watched you learn how to win. We've watched you learn how to lose. Um, we've really enjoyed watching your journey uh, through Wednesday Night Church. And uh, you're, you've kind of been born a fighter since you were just a little girl. And we've, we've enjoyed watching you go to Wednesday nights and, and find a way to kind of ease some of that and uh, find some peace um, through the Bible, through talking with Pastor and uh, everybody at youth group. Um, we're just excited to see your next journey. Um, we're excited to see you grow and hopefully find more peace and ease um, in all of those things. Um, Remember when things get chaotic, that there's truth in the Bible, that it can, it can find a path for you and get you back on that path, um, and hopefully ease, ease any of those things that are getting you. Um, we love you very much. That's the quietest I've ever heard you, Justin. <laughs> okay, just saying. <laughs> I've been to those football games, those basketball games. Um, those of you who know Justin know what I'm talking about. Um, what a privilege to have these students hear their parents say, we got your back. We're going to continue to go with you. We're going to continue to be there for you. And that's what a blessing is all about. It's, it's about declaring God's goodness on your life as well as maintaining that commitment to have their back, to be by their side when they need you. Um, and one of the things that we do at Sun Prairie, we love the Word of God, don't we? Yeah, yeah and, and so we, we want to send these students off to wherever they're going, a tech school, um, college, university, whatever, and we want to give them a, a new study Bible. It's the ESV study Bible. And Sadie, congratulations on your graduation. You're almost graduate, but uh, Maddie, congratulations, and God bless you, and Abby, congratulations, and God bless you. And I just have to say, these, these three ladies on Wednesday nights are, are just regular, and, and they are um, really good about um, asking the good questions. And it's been a real privilege to have the opportunity on Wednesday nights to sit with them over in our basement and to talk theology, to talk about God, to talk about life, and how God is to be the focus and the center of their life. Let, let, us, let us pray for them. Father God, we thank you for these and, and other graduates who couldn't make it today, Lord, we, we thank you that um, you have blessed them with good families to guide them, to lead them. And Lord, we pray for them as they go into a, a next part of their journey of life, Lord, that you would go with them, that you, that you would be closer to them and that when, when they struggle, when they have those difficulties, Lord, that you would draw them in, draw them into yourself. And Lord, Help them to quickly turn to you and to turn to your word, to seek guidance, to call home, to call the pastor, and, uh, and just ask for help. Lord, may they never be too proud, never be too, um, never have it so figured out that they don't cry out for help when they need it. God, we, we praise you for your goodness and grace in their lives, and we thank you for what you're going to do in the future in their lives. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Thank you all. Well, preschoolers are dismissed to Children's Church, and uh, if the rest of you, uh, well, when you're all done with those Kleenexes, if you would take your Bibles and... Uh, I see uh, people doing this, you know, whatever. Um, take your Bibles, turn to Malachi. Malachi chapter 1. Is there anyone here today who's been through every minor prophet that we've, as we've gone through these? Um, it, it's, it's been a, a rich blessing for me, I just have to say. We've been in this series of the Minor Prophets and looking at answers to major questions that the Minor Prophets offer us, okay? And today's the last one. Malachi is the, the end. It's the end of the Old Testament. And, um, uh, you know, most of us would agree that God, in fact, cares about 
how we worship. The question that Malachi, I think, answers in his prophecy is, does God care about our worship? But I think that we usually come up with false conclusions as to how we think God would have us to worship. You, you know, I, I know some people say the only way that you can worship is by using the King James Version of the Bible. Um, I use the ESV, the NIV. I, I use a number of different versions in preparation and also when I, when I quote um, in, in my messages. Um, some people feel that you can't really worship or they can't worship um, singing anything after 1960 when it comes to songs. Um, anything after 1960 is not sacred in, in their minds. Um, yet many of us, we appreciate many of the newer, um, the contemporary music that we sing in church. Uh, some people, I remember a time when somebody said, we never sing out of the hymnals anymore. And at that time, we did have hymnals in the pew. We took them out when COVID began, and we haven't put them back yet. I don't know if we will, but um, we, we, we sang hymns every Sunday. They didn't think we did because we didn't use the hymnals, but we do. We, we still sing hymns, and we, um, we love the hymns. Um, so, some people feel that not having that book in their hands, that they can't do it up on the screen. It's just not real worship. So, some people um, are concerned about the instruments we use. I, I once had a, an organist in a church tell me, Pastor, you can't really worship. It's not true worship until, unless, and she was totally serious, unless you have organ accompaniment. I said, really? Well, news to me. Um, and, and I also had another guy from another church. He had heard that we had brought in a drummer uh, to help us in our worship. And he said, y'all, because of that, that drummer, you're worshiping Satan. I mean, he, it was another pastor, actually. And... Uh, what you wear to worship. Now, some people really have difficulty with this one, um, what, what you wear to worship. I mean, some people are all about the pastor wearing a suit and tie. You know I'm not a tie guy. Um, but one thing I, I'm not is you'll never, ever, ever, praise the Lord, see me up here in shorts. Um, uh, something about a man's legs, especially mine, you know, uh, it's, it's not a good thing, um, but, but just saying, that, that, that's me. Um, so some people like this kind of lighting in the sanctuary. Other people, they'll go to a worship service, and it's really meaningful. The darker it is and the more colored lights and fog and all of that going on, um, it, it just makes worship that much deeper, not for me, okay? So, so we have these differences, but I don't think God really cares about that. I don't think God cares about any of that unless unless those things interfere with our worship, okay? If our focus is on the lighting, or if our focus is on the style of music, if our focus is on what somebody else is wearing or what we might not be wearing, um, you, you know, it might be interfering with our worship, and I think God is concerned about that. So today we conclude our series in the Minor Prophets, and like I said at the beginning of this whole series, the reason I did this was last September, um, some of us, D and I, were at our Converge Heartland District meetings, and as part of those meetings, Jim Capaldo always um, has a, a segment, it's a conference, a training conference, a learning conference called Cultivate. And this past year, he was able to book Mark Dever to come and speak to us. Now, Mark Dever, he speaks all around the world. He's um, the, the originator, the, the founder of Nine Marks Ministries, uh, out, of, out of Washington, D.C., and um, pastors a church there in D.C., Capitol Hill Baptist Church. Uh, Mark Dever is, uh, Jim said, the only re reason we got him to come to our, our deal was because everyone else had canceled because of COVID. And so he had an open calendar, and he came and he spoke to us. And one of the things he talked about in his sessions was the enjoyment he found in preaching through the minor prophets, and he said, I, I didn't preach like I normally preach, because Mark Dever is, is a preacher who uh, goes verse by verse, expository preaching, um, and he, he'll spend weeks on a verse. Uh, but in this, he said, he just did a 30,000-foot view of each of the minor prophets. And I thought, I've never done that. 
And I've only studied the Minor Prophets once in all my years here. We did it at a Bi Wednesday night Bible study. So I, I took that as a cue that maybe God would have us do this. And I have to tell you, as Mark Dever talked about how he enjoyed that, I too have enjoyed this. And I've heard from a number of you that you found enjoyment in this. As, as we hear how God, through his prophets, speak to the people about who he is and about how they are doing and what he would have them to do. So, here we come to Malachi. Malachi was written after Jerusalem's city walls and God's temple had been rebuilt. They'd come back from exile, and last week we looked at Haggai, and Haggai, he was encouraging them, trying to motivate them to get this temple built so that you can get back to your right worship. Well, as we'll see here, the temple had been built. They were back in it. They were doing their thing, but they weren't worshiping anymore. Their worship was flawed. It was all messed up. And, and so Malachi is coming at them. He's, he's giving the word of the Lord to, to them and uh, calling Israel to return to the Lord. So if you have your Bibles open, I want you to turn w back to the end. Chapter 4 at verse 4. He says this, Remember the law of my servant Moses and the statutes and rules that I commanded him at Horeb for all Israel. Remember the law of my servant Moses. In other words, God through the prophet Malachi is calling the people to turn from their wickedness. They've been living in sin and it was affecting their worship. Turn from their wickedness, turn back to God. Follow God's law because these are God's ways. These are God's, God's guiding principles for you. And the next prophet who comes along, we find in the New Testament, 400 years later, in Matthew chapter 3, verse 1. And this is what Matthew says. In those days, John the Baptist came preaching in the wilderness of Judea, repent. Repent. For the kingdom of heaven is at hand. What does John do? Same thing Malachi was doing. Malachi is calling the people to repentance. 400 years later, they had drifted again. And so John the Baptist comes to the people and he says, repent. Turn back to the Lord. That word repent means to turn away from your sinful living and turn back to God and follow God. 400 years later, they're having the same problem. Some people wonder, um, who are not part of the church, why would you go to church every Sunday? Hear the same book talked about every Sunday. Well, number one is, we need it. Okay? We need it. And just because I'm up here preaching doesn't mean I, I preach to myself, because as I'm studying, I am convicted over and over and over. We need to be reminded to turn back to God. We need to be reminded, as Malachi does here, what God has in store for us. Some of you have shared with me how um, God's love for his people has stood out to you in these minor prophets. Some, some have shared how it's been hard to, to hear about the destruction, but yet it teaches us how serious God is about sin. But his mercy is great. His mercy is more than our sin. And Israel is a picture to us of how God's mercy continually reaches out and pulls us back. If you're maybe not right with God right now, you've, you've kind of been walking your own way and you're struggling spiritually, maybe there's some sin in your life that needs confessing, Turn back to him. Repent. He longs to extend his mercy to you. So let's finish up. Malachi chapter 1, beginning at verse 1. The oracle of the word of the Lord to Israel by Micah. The oracle of the word of the Lord. In other words, this is a message of God. And he's giving it through this prophet Malachi. I have loved you. 
You know, so many of these prophecies have begun with condemnation over, of people over their sin. But this prophecy begins with, I have loved you, says the Lord. And the people of Israel, if they would just take a second and think about it, they wouldn't be asking the next, next question that Malachi says they asked. Because look what they say. How have you loved us? God, through the prophet, has just said, I have loved you. Oh, really? How have you loved us, God? How have you lo-? And God doesn't go and recount all the different ways that he has delivered them. Rather, he tells them that he loved them from the very beginning when he loved Jacob and not Esau. How have you loved us? Is not Esau Jacob's brother, declares the Lord. Yet I have loved Jacob, but Esau I have hated. I have laid waste his hill country and left his heritage to jackals of the desert. If Edom says, we are shattered, but we will rebuild the ruins, the Lord of hosts says, they may build, but I'll tear it down again, and they will be called the wicked country. And the people with whom the Lord is angry forever. Your own eyes shall see this, and you shall say, great is the Lord beyond the border of Israel. Israel is going to know how much God loved them because of how he punishes Edom. Now, Edom are the descendants of Esau. The Edomites were a wicked, evil people. And um, they, over and over again, worked to thwart God's plans. And we, we looked at that in Obadiah. When we studied Obadiah, we saw how God was making all these accusations against the Edomites. Remember the, the Edomites, they prohibited the, um, the Israelites from going through their land? You're not going through here. They, they attacked the Israelites. They didn't let the Israelites escape at, at one point. So, so the Edomites had been wicked against the Israelites. There's always been this tension between the sons of Esau and the sons of Jacob. And it started with those two, Jacob and Esau, from the time of their birth. There was always this animosity. There's always this division there. And God was saying, I loved Jacob and I hated Esau. And what he means by that when he says I hated Esau is that I hated their sin. And as a result of their sin, I destroyed them. I took care of them. And, and those are hard words for us. Because we want to have this picture of our loving God, and He is a loving God. But God also is a just God. And He deals with people who reject Him over and over again and who try to thwart His plan. And from this, Israel knows they, and they learn that God is victorious and God is in control. Verse 6. What we learn here about worship is that God cares about what we give, what we give as an offering to him. And we'll see it here in verses 6 and following. A son honors his father and a servant his master. If then I am a father, where is my honor? And if I am a master, where is my fear, says the Lord of hosts to you. O priests who despise my name, but you say, how have we despised your name? Um, Malachi does a good job of this, of um, recording God's um, statement, Israel's question, and then God's response to that, his answer to the question. Uh, How have we despised your name? God says, by offering polluted food upon my altar. But you say, how have we polluted you? By saying that the Lord's table may be despised. When you offer blind animals and sacrifice, is that not evil? And when you offer those who are lame or sick, is that not evil? Present that to your governor. Will he accept you or show you favor, says the Lord of hosts? And now entreat the favor of God, that he may be gracious to us. With such a gift from your hand, will he show favor to any of you, says the Lord of hosts? Oh, that there were among, well, one among you who would shut the doors. In other words, cease this. Stop this, because they're, what, what they're doing is, is people were bringing blemished sacrifices. They weren't bringing the best, which the Old Testament law said that they were supposed to do. And God is saying, if, if there was just one of you priests who would just shut the door to this, stop this, end this um, despicable practice of bringing wounded sheep, 
a, a bringing a, a lame sheep, a, a bringing an offering that is not fit to offer to the Lord. And what he's teaching us here, what he's teaching these people, is that when we come to worship, when these people came to the temple, they were to bring their best. But what they had gotten caught up in was saving the best so that they could either enjoy it themselves or they could sell it for a higher profit than that lame one. And God wasn't happy about that. This was not acceptable worship. And in fact, he's telling the priest, shut the doors. Shut the doors. For my name will be great among the nations, he says in verse 11, says the Lord of hosts. But you profane it when you say that the Lord's table is polluted and its fruit, that is, its food may be despised. But you say, what a weariness this is. And you snort at it. In other words, the priests were saying, all of these rituals, there's so much to do. Why do we have to do all of this? It's such a pain. I imagine that those three standing up here, there's been one Sunday morning, maybe, when they said, why do we have to go to church again? When we don't take worship seriously, when we don't take God seriously, we're doing the exact same thing that God condemns these people for, these people of Judah. What a weariness it is. You bring what has been taken by violence or is lame or sick, and this you bring as your offering. Shall I accept that from your hand, says the Lord? Cursed be the cheat who has a male in his flock and vows it and yet sacrifices to the Lord what is blemished, for I am a great king. In other words, I am deserving of your best. And we talked about this last week when we talked about giving our best to the Lord. And what is the curse that he talks about here? The curse we talked about last week, that no matter how hard they strive to, to enjoy the, the benefits of more and more and more, they will never be satisfied. That's the curse that he's referencing here. There's a couple of questions I think we should ask ourselves when it comes to our worship. And, and one is this, as I live my life, am I committed to living out Christ's mission? Am I offering my life up for his mission? Or is my life mission all about me? I asked this oh, a couple of months ago. Do you have a life mission statement? My, my life mission statement is to know God and to make him known. It happens to be something I, I caught while I was working with youth with a mission some years ago. And I just said, that's, that's kind of where I'm at. It's how I want to live my life to know God and make him known. A second question I think we need to ask is, um, not, not in addition to how am I offering my life to his mission, is this. As I come to worship, am I giving my best? Am I giving sacrificially? Am I giving my full attention to be mindful of his glory and majesty? As I sing the songs that we sing, as I listen to the word that, as it's read, as I listen to the word as it's spoken, talked about in Sunday school and in worship? Am I giving my all? Am I or, oh, pastor, I'm just so tired today. I was up so late last night. Then get to bed earlier. If, if you can't give all of yourself here this morning, you might as well not come. We have to work to worship, don't we? Because there's so many other things that can distract us, so many other things that, that get in the way, so many other things we want, that worship becomes work. And it, even if it is, do it. And, and let us do it right. Let us give our best and let us give sacrificially. Hudson Taylor, he was the founder of China Inland Mission, said something many, many years ago. He said, Christ is either Lord of all or he is not Lord at all. And he was getting at this point. Christ is either Lord of all of your life or he's not Lord at all. Malachi goes on in chapter 2, accusing, continuing to accuse the priests for failing to confront the people about their sin. 
It's the job of the priest to make these sacrifices, but when they knew that the people were not making right sacrifices, it was their duty to, to do a kind of correction in the process. Well, how is God concerned about worship? He's, he's concerned that we offer our best to him. Secondly, he's concerned that we come to worship not having profaned worship in unrighteous relationships. I looked up at the clock and it says 1030. Wow, we got a long way to go here. No, just kidding. Um, I don't know where we are. Um, but I'd like to pick up in chapter 2, verse 10. Have we not all one Father? Has not one God created us? Why then are we faithless to one another, profaning the covenant of our fathers? Judah has been faithless, and an abomination has been committed in Israel and in Jerusalem. For Judah has profaned the sanctuary of the Lord, which he loves, and has married the daughter of a foreign god. What he's talking about here is marrying pagan women, primarily. The men would marry beautiful women from other nations. They worshipped pagan gods, and they were violating the temple. They were violating temple worship as a result because these pagan women would lead their husbands astray. And Paul talks about this in 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 14, where he tells believers there, do not be unequally yoked. And I tell this to our students, I tell this to people um, who are thinking about dating. If you're dating somebody and they don't share your convictions about Jesus Christ, drop them. Say goodbye nicely. Say goodbye. Because what's going to happen is they're going to cause you to drift. They're going to pull you away from the Lord rather than help you get there. In Ephesians 5, um, God compares, or Paul compares the husband and wife relationship with our relationship with, with Christ, Christ in the church. And it's a beautiful comparison. And in it, he calls it, in, um, Oh, what is it, chapter 5, I think, verse 37. Um, he says, this, this marriage relationship, it is a mystery. And, and the mystery is found, um, Malachi talks about it. Uh, here in chapter 2, he talks about it in verse 15. Did he not make them one, talking about husbands and wives, with a portion of the Spirit in their union? Now, there's, when a husband and wife come together in marriage, making covenant union with each other, the thing that is mysterious about it is that this one flesh is a spiritual union. And it is both husband's spirit, wife's spirit, and the spirit of God. It's why as husbands and wives, we should, it, it should be a no-brainer that we pray together. If we're believers, if, if we share that common faith, we will pray together because we, we talk to that same spirit. We, we, in, we intercede with that same spirit. We, we fellowship with that same spirit. And that's what makes the marital bond so deep and so, so amazing. It is a mystery, and it is a mystery because the Holy Spirit has wed us. Back up to verse 12, chapter 2. May the Lord cut off from the tents of Jacob any descendant of the man who does, does this, that is, marries a, a pagan woman who brings an offering to the Lord of the hosts. And the second thing you do, not only are they marrying women who are going to cause them to drift, we saw this with Solomon, you cover the Lord's altar with tears, with weeping and groaning because he no longer regards the offering or accepts it with favor from your hand. But you say, why does he not? Because the Lord is witness between you and the wife of your youth to whom you have been faithless or unfaithful. Though she is your companion and your wife by covenant, did he not make them one with a portion of the Spirit in their union? And what was the one God seeking? Why does God bring men and women together? It's all about his mission to draw all people to himself. What's the result of this godly union of a husband and a wife? Godly offspring. Godly offspring. Right there in verse 15. So guard yourselves in your spirit. Let none of you be faithless in the wife of your youth. 
For the man who hates and divorces says to the Lord, the God of Israel covers his garment with violence. So guard yourselves in your spirit and do not be faithless. So two things, three things that, that he is saying here. You've been marrying pagan women. You, you've been unfaithful to your wife. And you've been, y'all are divorced, divorcing your wives. This is all wrong. And what is happening is it's affecting their worship. It's profaning their worship. God is concerned about that. He's very concerned about the family. He's very concerned about relationships between husbands and wives. Because as we read in um, um, 1 Peter, 2 Peter, Peter talks about husbands that are at odds with their wives. He said, get right with your wife. Whatever problem's going on, fix it. Okay, deal with it. Because to the extent that you are at odds with your wife, the Lord will not listen to your prayers. So, don't go to bed angry with your spouse. All right? It's okay to fight. It's okay to have those arguments. But get it resolved. Don't hold that grudge. Chapter 3, verse 5. He goes on to talk about other relationships that are profaning their worship. I will draw near to you for judgment. I will be a swift witness against the sorcerers, against the adulterers, against those who swear falsely, against those who oppress hired workers in his wages, against those who oppress the widow and the fatherless, against those who thrust aside the sojourner, and do not fear me, says the Lord of hosts. So another thing that profanes their worship, it gets in, way, it gets in the way of their worship, is when they don't treat other people right, okay? And, and I, I was going to go and um, um, elaborate on these, but I won't. I'll let you read, read that and, and figure that out. The final way that God is concerned about our worship, he, he's concerned that we offer our best. He's concerned that we live in relationships with other people so as not to profane our worship. And thirdly, the final way that God is concerned about our worship is in how we understand and relate to him. Jump down to verse 6 of chapter 3. For I, the Lord, do not change. Therefore, you, O children of Jacob, are not consumed. Because he's made a covenant with them. He's, he's not going to consume them. He's not going to destroy, utterly destroy them. From the days of your fathers, you have turned aside from my statutes. In other words, you have not respected the law that I set before you. And you have not kept them. Return to me, and I will return to you, says the Lord of hosts. But you say, how shall we return? Will man rob God? Yet you are robbing me. But you say, how have we robbed you? In your tithes and your contributions, you are cursed with a curse. Again, we talked about what that curse is last week. Not being fulfilled. For you are robbing me, the whole nation of you. Bring the full tithes into the storehouse that there may be food in my house, and thereby put me to the test, says the Lord of hosts, if I will not open the windows of heaven for you and pour down for you a blessing. Here it is again. God is going to bless them. They, he wants them to understand that I am the God who has made a covenant with you. I am the God who continues to call you back to myself through the judges, through the prophets, through kings, I continue to have to reach out and grab you and pull you to myself. That's the God I am. And they thought that he was just a God who's out to get them. Maybe, maybe you're somebody who thinks about God that way, that God's just waiting for me to mess up and to let me have it. That's not who he is. He is a God who longs to have fellowship with you but so often we're running away. And he's chasing after us, just like he did Israel, over and over and over again. He chased after them, and he grabbed onto them, and he brought them back to himself. That's the God he is. Yet, as he has also said, he's a God of justice. They have not respected God's law, 3-7. They have not recognized all that God, uh, all that is around us is God's, chapter 3, verse 10. They've not recognized that we are created for the glory of God, not the other way around. Look at verse 14 of chapter 3. You have said it is vain to serve God. 
What is the profit of our keeping his charge or of walking as mourning before the Lord of hosts? Um, God is telling him, hey, I wasn't created for you. You were created for me. Finally, we read it at the beginning of our service today is our call to worship. God blesses those who fear him and he judges those who despise him. Chapter four, verses one through three. For behold, the day is coming, burning like an oven, when all the arrogant and the evildoers will be stubble. The day that is coming shall set them ablaze, says the Lord of hosts, so that it will leave them neither root nor branch. But for you who fear my name, the sun of righteousness shall rise with healing in its wings. You shall go out leaping like calves from the stall. The NIV that we read earlier said well-fed calves. In other words, they've been in the stall, they've been well-fed, now they're being let out. How many of you can relate? You've seen that picture before, the calves. And uh, I, I like to think of it more as the, the calf that gets out of that squeeze chute and takes off leaping and bounding, right? Um, yeah. That's, that's the beauty. When we are in a right relationship with God, when we are enjoying real fellowship, real worship, Malachi is giving us a picture of what happens in communities where those who fear God worship him in righteousness. The first thing is healing. He says, I will heal you. I believe that when the church in a community is worshiping God from a right heart, a righteous heart, I believe that healing comes to that community where that church is part. I believe that God wants to bring healing into our communities through the church, through our worship, giving of our best. Is, is what God, when God spoke to Solomon at the dedication of Solomon's temple, that glorious temple, God spoke to Solomon and he said, if my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray, I will come and heal their land. I will come and heal their land. I, I, I and, and then that picture of the calf leaping out of the stall, well fed, is a picture of joy. People from the outside looking into the church, that's what they need to see. And I believe that if our worship of the Lord is right and true, unhindered, unencumbered by the things that were going on in Israel, that sometimes goes on in our lives, I believe that that joy will be great and that joy will be a witness to those around us. Friends, don't think we'll be at we'll bring peace and joy into the world on our own, by our own strength. I believe that real peace, real joy, real healing in our land comes when the church gets down and gets worshiping the right way. Fueled by a holy and extravagant offering of ourselves, fueled by God honoring relationships and fueled by right theology of who God is. So, let's be the church that changes the world by our worship. Amen? I'd like you to stand with us now. And we're going to sing a song. It's one of the great hymns of the faith. And uh, let's sing it out as if we mean it.